2 Peter chapter 3, I want to dial in on this last verse here where it says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Let's remember that what we do now can last forever with the rewards that are coming. But here he's trying to tell us something. Those first words he says, but grow. God's will, as you can tell, our theme for the year, is that we ought to grow. Now, growth isn't just experienced in your coat size or your belt size, right, or, uh, or your shoe size. Growth is experienced in the Christian life through the fruit of the Spirit in your life. It's through uh, you growing spiritually. And he gives us two measurements here. He gives us these two metrics. He says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we need to increase our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we need to increase God's grace working through us as is evidence toward other people. So grace, God wants us to show that we're growing in grace to other people. And that's what we're going to really focus in on. We're going to touch on all three, grow, grace, and know. Um, uh, let me give you a few thoughts here. So he says to grow. And I, I want to point out that this is not an option. This is a commandment. You are commanded to grow spiritually. God wants you to grow. He wants you to grow spiritually. Some people just refuse to do it. Well, it's not my, I'm not supposed to be there. I'm not in the ministry. We come up with all these great excuses why it's okay to just be mediocre, to be middle of the road, and never really begin to excel for God. But God's will is that you would begin to grow spiritually from the inside out, and that it would be evident to other people that God is working through your life, that you have a portion of the Holy Spirit that's just charging you up and firing you up and giving you a zeal and excitement and marching orders, if you will. We have a duty. We have a commandment. God has things that He wants us to accomplish here on earth. And He gives us these two metrics. He says, grow. And then He says, in grace. And then He says, knowledge. So He wants us to know more spiritually. So He says, what's the first two words in this verse? but grow. This is a command Amen. for you. Will you do it? Or are you going to dig in your heels and just say, no, not me. I'm not ready. I've got other things I'm trying to do while I'm here on this earth. No, no. Notice he's at the end of that verse, he says that he gets the glory when he says, to him be the glory both now in your life and forever in eternity. And the more that we give him the glory by growing now, the more He'll reward us forever in eternity. He has a big plan for us, and we're a little puzzle piece in the big picture. The question is, will you fill up the boundaries, the borders of that puzzle piece that God has for you? God has a ministry for you as an individual. Listen, you know what makes this church so great? It's every individual that's choosing to grow, person by person, day by day. Every day that you dig into the Word of God, you begin to grow. I want to show you a couple areas of growth. Go to 2 Kings chapter 19. Uh, God said grow. And I ask you, how are you growing? Where have you grown over this past year or the past five, six years as we come up on a six-year anniversary with our church? And it's important for us as Christians to have some zeal and some excitement. We shouldn't have this defeated mentality. Oh man, boy, the devil's got us on the run. Well, I'm just trying to survive. That doesn't please the Lord. Listen, I know we're going to go through times of suffering and yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right? Uh, but listen, we shouldn't be afraid. We've not been given the spirit of fear. We've been given a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. And if we use those things and let that grace of God work through us to where it becomes evident to those that are around us, we can see God's victory in our life. I believe it's important for you to have Christ confidence in your life and understand there's a big vision that God has for you and until you get on his plan you're just going to have failures in your life because God's trying to get your attention when you get on his plan and you say you know what Lord I need to scrap my plans I've got this thing I'm focused on and I need to let go I need to focus on you I need to see your will for my life and my spiritual growth and when
when you set your sights on that, then God will begin to bless you in other areas of your life. Too many times we get tangled up and tripped up and we stumble at the problems in this world and it's because we're not focusing on our growth. We're too worried about uh, what, what's going on down here. We forget to give Him the glory. And listen, I want you to know something. Your Father wants to bless you. God does want His children to have great blessings. There were many millionaires in the Bible, and they didn't start out that way. They had to grow through hard times and become responsible, mature, able to handle these blessings so that they could be the conduit or the messenger of the blessing that they let go to other people. God wants to increase you with gifts and grace so that you can give it to somebody else, not just hold on to it for yourself. We need to see God's blessing in our life. And listen, I want you to understand this. It is God's will that you would ask Him for more blessings. It is God's will that you would ask Him for areas of spiritual growth. It is God's will that you would search out and ask for more things. And Lord, give me more work to do and give me more growth and give me more opportunities. And then you, oh, you walk through the doors that He opens. That's His will for you. God wants us, I believe, to expect supernatural growth. God wants us to expect big things. Yeah. Climbing big mountains, our confidence is in Him. Now you're in 2 Kings 19. This is an interesting portion of the story where Isaiah the prophet comes and he's preaching to Hezekiah. This was a time of war. They were dealing with a famine. The food was low. Everybody was discouraged. The enemy was you know, using their words to tear them down and they started to believe the lie. And God sent His prophet to give them an encouraging word and give them some, prophet, some promises. Uh, if you will, look at verse number 29. 2 Kings 19. Verse number 29, And this shall be a sign unto thee, ye shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves. And in the second year that which springeth of the same. And in the third year sow ye, and reap, and plant vineyards, and eat the fruits thereof. This was a big promise to them in a very distressed time. This was encouragement. Where they're like, I'm at the end of my rope, things aren't working, everything's failing, I don't know what to do, I don't know where to go. They went to God. He prayed to God. And God answered by sending Isaiah with an answer from the Lord. And he says, here's what I'm going to do for you. He says, you get ready to grow. You get ready to eat. And then next year you're going to eat again. And then the third year you're going to grow your own garden and it's gonna, things are going to begin to spread bring up. Look at the next verse, verse 30. He says, and the remnant, that's the remainder, the last few that were left, and the remnant that is escaped out of the house of Judah sh shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. Listen, when you put your root in the Word of God, you'll begin to get some spiritual fruit springing up in your life. And when, when fruit begins to come upward, that's when God can work miracles in your life. Whether it's a good day or a bad day, you ought to have a smile on your face because God's been good to you. Look at the next verse, verse 31. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. <laughs> Zeal's a strong word. Uh, go just a few pages. Go to 1 Chronicles chapter 4. The zeal of the Lord. You know what the zeal... I mean, God is excited to bless His people and pull them out of the miry pit. Pull them out of a distressed time. He says, I know you're hurting. I know you're suffering. I know you're going through hard things. But you put it on me. You talk to me. You ask of me. And I've got a big promise for you. You're going to grow. Things will spring up. I've got a blessing for you. The problem is most Christians never ask for it. We just have that... What was that old cartoon? Eeyore... Oh, bother. Oh, me, oh, my. What was the other one? Linus, we had the cloud over his head all the time. There was a dark cloud that came in the room. Hey, brother, how you doing? Oh, I don't know. If, I'm just not sure how things are going. It's like, really? I thought you were a Christian. You know what I love to say? People, how are you doing to say, man, if it got any better, I wouldn't be able to stand it. I mean, and listen, yeah, I have rough days too, but you know what? I believe through the power of God, the promise of God, and the Holy Spirit of God, and when I lift somebody else up and they smile, they're like, man, that's cool. 
and I get a smile from somebody else, I believe that the Lord can use us to encourage this distressed world. We have nothing to worry about. We have nothing to be afraid about. This world is temporary. Where we're going is permanent. It's forever. It's amazing. And when we set our sights on that, and we realize that's what we're growing into, it's kind of like, yeah, I've had a few setbacks, but it's okay. God is good. He's provided for everything. Haven't missed a meal. Uh, you know, not missing any limbs. I mean, the children are all good. I mean, I mean, think about it. I went and visited somebody in the hospital this week, and I mean, he's having a rough time. Hit his head. He's already had brain damage. There's a metal plate in his head. Caused him to fall. Had a, I mean, major, major problems. I walked into the hospital room. I took Naomi with me. She's my... She's usually my silent partner, soul winning. And Naomi has this pink cowgirl hat. And at first I'm like, I started to tell her, no, leave that at home. This is a serious matter. We're going to minister to the sick and the hurt. She had that big old smile. I said, yeah, come on, it's all right. We'll bring in everybody through the hospital. We're going through all these floors trying to find them. And everybody was just encouraged. It's like, oh, wow, cool, I love it. You know, can I have that hat? We got into that room and this young man who has been down and distressed all day, his whole family's pouring over him like with this look of, anguish and pain because what he's going through is a big deal when half of his body's not working right one of his eyes it looks terrible he's dealing with major brain trauma this is a rough time and we came in there through the power of the holy spirit to lift up their spirits and encourage them this guy was smiling giving high fives to Naomi, trying to, he's pl playing with my pocket, just being funny. And it's like, it was good to see the humor and it was good to lift their spirits. And, and you know, to be able to go in there and pray with somebody that's discouraged and distressed. And when he walked out, I just felt like, wow, to God be the glory. Yeah. I hope that if I'm in a hospital bed like that and all my family's surrounding me with this miserable outlook, oh no. And I asked the guy, I say, hey, you, when you get out of here, you're going to go soul in with me? Yeah, yeah. I'd given him a t-shirt, one of our t-shirts that says, once saved, always saved. I brought it up and his wife said, that's what they carried him in here in. Well, praise the Lord. I hope they carry him out in it. I hope he walks out in it. And I'm asking God to heal that young man and to help him and protect him and protect that family. And listen, we have the power of the positive Holy Spirit, the good news, and we should carry this to people that are broken and downtrodden and encourage them and lift them up. And we need to quit listening to the bad news and repeating their outlook, their doom and gloom. We've got good news. It's forever. I don't care what the Federal Reserve does. Look, I've got the Lord Jesus Christ and He paves the streets with God in heaven and we have that to look forward to we ought to have a good spirit first Corinthians chapter 4 I want you to see this look at verse number 9 look at verse number 9 and Jabez was more honorable than his brethren why it's about to tell us and his mother called his name Jabez because saying I bear him with sorrow what a name hey mr. Uh, born in sorrow can you imagine that like names mean things don't they Oh, born in sorrow, come on in. Oh, it's Mr. Sad Guy. Boy, that'd be terrible. But he was more honorable. Why? Because he didn't let that get him down. Look at the next verse, verse 10. And Jabez called on the God of Israel. Here's his prayer. Saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me, and God granted him that which he requested. What a blessing. God, would you give me more? Would you go with me? Would you protect me? Would you help me to be a blessing to others? And God says, yeah, that's a good prayer. I'm going to answer that big prayer. Are you praying any big prayers? Are you asking God to do miraculous things in your life? Are you submitting yourself to the will of God as a living sacrifice ready to go when he says go? Go to Isaiah 54, please. Isaiah 54. I believe God wants us to ask for big things, miraculous things. I think God is more glorified when I ask for a huge answer to prayer than when I just ask for something little. Oh Lord, I'm in a hurry. Could you make that light green? And He may answer that or He may make it go red to protect you so you don't get in a wreck. He could go either way. But boy, when you start asking for miraculous things, like, Lord, the Bible says you can move mountains, and I need you to move a mountain, and I believe you can. Can you move this mountain for me? He says, I thought you'd never ask. 
Instead, we get the shovel and we're like, oh, it's going to take forever. I'm going to try real hard. I'm going to die trying. You know, we have this bad attitude. That's not right. That's not of the Holy Spirit. That's of our own spirit. We need to look to God. We need to let Him work. Isaiah 52. Now, we know Isaiah 53 is famous as the prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So many great verses there about Him. And then we get into this sort of a millennial promise, but it applies today in chapter 54. Look at verse number 2. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. Now he's talking about a tent. Here, boy, he's talking about one of those big tops, like a big revival tent. He's like, stretch it out, get taller, get bigger, expect God to do big things. This is God promising it to his children. Verse, 50, ver verse 3. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither shalt thou be confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. God's trying to give him some good news. You know what? I know you had some mistakes in the past. Don't worry about that. You just work for me. You expect big things. You ask for great things for the purpose of the next generation. Did you notice there was a blessing to the seed? We ask for God's help here that this wouldn't just be a flash in the pan ministry, that it would be something that we can hand down and pass the torch to the next generation, that we can pass it on and the children that are in the church today that sit over here and play these musical instruments that one day us old men we're going to sit down and we're going to learn from them they're going to preach and they're going to teach and we're going to rub the heads of their of our grandbabies and we're going to watch God do a multi-generational work that's our prayer isn't it when we ask God for a blessing it's not a selfish blessing it's to see his blessing on the next generation it's for the benefit of others we're asking God for a lasting and enduring promise not just for ourselves and our families no but for everybody else around us he says you're gonna break forth on the left and on the right make your tent a little bigger are you expecting a supernatural blessing from God if you would go back to or go to first Peter 3 this time go to Peter but first Peter 3 Will you grow? You've been commanded to grow. Well, how do we need to grow? There's many areas we can talk about and measure growth in our life. God's given us a couple. I just wanted you to see this first. He said grow. Do you believe it? Do you, will you receive it? Will you obey it? Will you find some way in your life to grow where you can say, Lord, I'm not growing here. I need to grow here. I want to get this out of my life and I want to grow over here. Show me, help me, guide me. I'll go. Are you willing? Remember he says, grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in knowledge. Now, how do we do that? What is the source of all truth? It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. 1 Peter 3, 15, look at this. 1 Peter 3, 15. But sanctify, that means set apart for a holy reason, right? Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Separate your heart. Get ready to give an answer. Oh, are you one of those Christians? Or, well, we're, I'm a Nazarene. What's better than, well, you're a Baptist. You think you're better than me. Or what's different? Well, I don't think I'm better. I'm humbled. I don't deserve salvation. I know I can't earn it. It's all by God. He did all the hard work. I just have to believe Him. We need to be ready to give an answer to every man. This is evidence of growth. When somebody comes to you and says, what do I have to do to be saved? Can you answer them? Can you open it? Can you show them? You believed it to get saved, and you can give them your testimony, but are you prepared to give them God's testimony? Have you exercised yourself and prepared yourself to be a witness for Him to teach the Gospel? If you would, go to Colossians chapter 4. Go to Colossians chapter 4. There's several areas in our life that we can grow to know the Word of God, to know Jesus more. We need to read the Bible. We need to pray every day. What's that song? Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. 
That's just, that's a, a kid's song, but the promise is true for adults also. It doesn't matter your age. You can grow spiritually and add and increase your tent size and lift it up and build it up, right? God wants you to enlarge your coast and enlarge your tent. That's what He wants you to do. He wants you to grow. So you read. You pray every day. You ought to try this sometime. You ought to try praying the Word of God back to God. Lord, I see this promise, this one verse, really applies to me with what I'm struggling with where I need your help. I'm going to pray it to you because you promised. And I'm going to pray it to you believing I'll receive that promise from you. I, I need a blessing. I'm going to pray your Word. You should try praying God's Word back to Him. Read the Bible. Pray. You need to study the Bible. You know, all the other new Bible translations, they delete that word because they don't want you to study it for yourself. They want you to go to them and ask what it means. Study to show thyself approved. You need to study to show to God that you want to know of Him more. You need to grow in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is His command. We need to memorize God's Word. Psalm 119 couldn't be any clearer. You commit it to memory. It'll help you from sinning, won't it? It will keep you from sinning. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed thereto according to his word. If you will take his word and put it in your heart, take it with you. I, I recommend a three by five card. Write a verse down. Work that verse. Think of that verse. Try to memorize that verse. Get it in your heart. Then all of a sudden you've got some spiritual power when you need it. You have the strength of God that can come back to your remembrance when you need it the most. We need to meditate on God's word also. I may preach a sermon on meditation, a biblical perspective. Uh, we were talking about it with Brother Dustin, Brother Jake and I were talking about it. There's 20 mentions of the word meditate in the Bible, and each one gives us a little bit of an insight, a little bit of a key, or the purpose, or the application. There's some overflow. It wouldn't be a 20-point sermon, but we are to meditate on His Word. Sometimes we get up and we read our daily proverb, or however you start your day, and well, you may not make it very far, but you really dig in deep on one concept. Ooh, Lord, that's me. I messed up this week, and I don't want to mess up today or next week. Let me meditate on this. What else does this mean? How can I apply it? We need to really meditate on God's Word. That's to chew on it for a while and take it with you. And throughout your day, perhaps you're slightly distracted by the thoughts in your mind of God's Word more so than what can I, what can I feed my flesh today? Colossians chapter 4. So in 1 Peter 3, stay in Colossians 4. 1 Peter 3, he said, be ready always to give an answer to every man. Right? You're in Colossians 4. Look at verse number 5. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. That's everybody outside of the church. Redeeming the time. That means making the best of every minute. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how you ought to answer every man. Same concept in a different life. You ought to be able to speak some grace into somebody else's life. He says, uh, let your all way with grace, season with salt, that ye may know. Sometimes we don't know how to answer. We don't know. We don't have the knowledge because we didn't do the studying, the reading, the praying, the hard work. We didn't memorize it. And somebody says, hey man, I got a question for you out of the Bible. And you're like, um, ooh, I saw a really good video on that like a year ago. I forget what the conclusion was. That helps them nothing. But when you study in for yourself, and this is why I love soul winning, it, it, it would always get me, it's like, I knock on a door, I hit somebody, and it's like, you know, I think I know Pentecostalism. Then I hit a Pentecostal that says things I've never heard. And I'm like, man, I need to go back to the drawing board. I'm going to write these things down. I'm going to study them out. I'm going to find the verses that really answer that. And then when you study something, you've prepared yourself, the Lord takes you to the next person, and you can give an answer, and they're like, oh, wow. I never saw it like that. Well, it's the Word of God. The answers are here. We just we haven't studied the answer book. That's our job. Go to Galatians 5. Let your speech be always with grace. How ought we to be as Christians? Well, we need to be speaking gracefully to the people in this world and let them know that God loves them and that He died for their sins. He's got great gifts for them, but most will never receive them because they don't know. They don't have the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is to our shame. Most of the time we drop the ball because we're distracted. Boy, if we would just really sacrifice our time here and focus on Him and sanctify our heart, set apart a place in your heart like, I need some set apart time for God. It will change things in your life. I promise you that. It will. Now I want to talk about grace and we'll finish with this. 
Now, grace is when we show God's loving kindness to undeserving people. Didn't God give us unmerited favor? That's a very common definition of grace. Unmerited, unearned favor. He likes us. Why? Is it because I'm such a great person? No. No, grace is a gift. Grace is free. Grace is not earned by you working your way to heaven. Grace is a gift. God loves you. He wants you to receive the gospel. Uh, you're in Galatians. We touched on this, I think it was last week. Look at verse number uh, 22. Galatians 5, verse number 22. How do we show loving kindness to others? But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love, so we're supposed to love others. Joy, we're happy. We have true joy that no man can take our joy. Peace, you know, blessed be the peacemakers. I know the news is telling us about all these different worlds and all these different countries and if, if you don't hate the North Koreans or the Russians or the Palestinians, then you know, you're not right with the news, but I want to be right with God and I could care less about every other country. I want to be a peacemaker in my space and I want to be a peacemaker here and I don't want to advocate for war. I want to be able to defend my house in freedom that God's given us over here and I want to be a peacemaker with my friends, my neighbors, with strangers, with the lost. That's what God's called us to do, to reconcile people unto him love joy peace and let me let me make a suggestion right now I, I mentioned memorization take a three by five write these verses down take them with you this week be able to memorize and preach these if anybody needs to know what Christianity ought to look like next time somebody says yeah those Christians a bunch of hypocrites you can say well if I could just tell you they're fake Christians they preach a fake gospel out of a fake Bible. They preach another Jesus. But let me tell you what true Christianity ought to look like. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, putting up with somebody for a long time. God put up with you. In fact, I think He still does, doesn't He? Oh, yeah. yeah, He's still patient with you. <laughs> long-suffering, gentleness. Not rough. Gentleness with others. Goodness. Faith, meekness, temperance. Temperance, you know, your temperature doesn't rise when things don't go wrong. You're stable throughout all temperatures, right? You can, you can just maintain an even keel and you're not just set off. You don't fly off the handle and lose your temper. Temperance, against such, there is no law. There's no law against that. There is no law. If you'll memorize these and apply them to your life, I promise you it will help you. Now go to uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. So what, I, what to Christianity look like? Well, it ought to be us showing grace to others and uh, be ready always to give an answer. And we ought to let our speech be with grace, seasoned with salt, that we may know how to, to answer every man. We ought to have the Word of God in our hearts so we can share it with others so they understand the difference. Well, I've been to a church, but what's different? I mean, you have a church and I've been to a church. They're all the same, right? Not really. Not really. It, are we in it for God's glory? Are we learning to grow in love? Are we learning to grow in the Word and how we show our love to other people? Ephesians 4, if you would look at verse number 7. But unto every one is, one, one of us is given grace. So grace is given, right? Grace is a gift. According to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Those gifts are grace. Uh, the Calvinist would say, well, faith is the gift. I wasn't able to believe. I was a hater of God. And the Holy Spirit forced that faith into my heart. I was converted before I heard the gospel. They literally turned Romans 10 up on, up, upside down on its head. No, you have to choose. You're personally responsible for believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. The faith is not the gift. Grace is a gift from God. Well, how do I get the grace? You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what grace do I receive? Well, there's saving grace. That He doesn't send me to hell that I deserve. And that He gives me forgiveness of sins that I could never earn. And then, you know what He does? He gives you the Holy Spirit. Boy, that's another awesome gift. And then maybe He gives you a ministry and office that's a portion of grace. And then maybe He gives you a little grace to have with others. I really believe God has helped me 
to be more patient with other people, to show them grace. And yet I as a man stand here condemned that even this week I've lost my temper with somebody. I didn't say anything too terrible, but I just felt like, man, I really dropped the ball there. I, I, would, I let things get where it shouldn't be, and I've failed, and I beat my chest, and I come to the Lord. Lord, I'm sorry. I, I've made a fool of myself. Well, He continues to show me grace. And now I need to take that grace and show it to somebody else. And they need to go back and say, hey man, I'm sorry. Love you. There's no point in that. God's given us grace as a gift. He wants us to share it with the world. The world doesn't have that. The other religions don't have it. But through the power of His Holy Spirit, we can. I believe it's important for us to show kindness and blessings just as God has given you. Who would, who would raise their hand and say, I have a blessing from God. I don't deserve. It was a gift. I've got things that I just, I, whoa, this is more than I can handle. This is more than I deserve. This is bigger than... He says, Amen. That's your Father. He loves you. Now look at verse 11. Ephesians 4, verse 11. And He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So He gave these offices can be gifts for the local church. The fact that we have several men that want to be teachers and they come and preach on men's preaching night, that's a gift. God is giving you a message through that man because He has the Holy Spirit and it's going to touch your heart if you'll let it. Right? God gives us offices because He loves us. He says in verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, so we can get more complete. For the work of the ministry, so we can get more done. For the edifying of the body of Christ, to build up His local church, to edify. It's an edifice, a building, to continue to add more, to be able to do more for God's glory. Now it gets interesting here in verse 13. He says, till we all come into the unity of the faith. Okay, so we got to get on the same page and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Again, perfect doesn't mean sinless perfection. It means completion as we grow up. The example I always use, the midwife on our last baby, she's like, she's perfect. I'm like, I know she is. And she, well, she's got all her fingers and toes and her eyes are open. And you know, and I'm like, no, no, she's perfect, right? Uh, God looks at us and He wants us to be complete. Some of us are not complete because we're not growing as we ought to. Our growth has been hindered or retarded. Verse 13, though, in the second half, look what he says. This is important. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We measure ourselves to the stature or the height of Christ unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. One day we're going to be just like him in the resurrection in regard to our holy body. Right now we don't have a holy body. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us to help us to purge out things in our life. But he says, you have some choices you can make to receive more grace, to become more like Christ, and you need to measure yourself to Christ. On our bookshelves at the house, at the end of it, we have this printout chart, and it's like, you know, seven foot, six foot, five foot, four foot, three foot, two foot, and the kids come up and they, they check their line. And you know what? Daddy's up here, and they're measuring because they want to get to the fullness of the stature of daddy. And they, one of them probably will be as tall as daddy. There's no telling. Those girls are getting tall, right? Uh, but now, do you have that attitude like, I want to be as tall as Christ? Well, what does that mean? I want to get the sin out of my life and become perfected and completed in God's will and His vision for you. Listen to me. Listen, every one of you, God has a plan for you. God has a perfect will for you. And some of us have kind of gone off the path. And we're not in His perfect will. We're in His will, but we can get back into His perfect will and get on target for the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. Amen. we got to keep growing. Yeah. Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive as children are deceived with fake magic tricks. Well, some Christians are too. Well, I saw a YouTube video and it says God didn't preserve His Word, that the Catholics have it. It's like, whoa, 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 not so fast, buddy. Well, I saw, I saw a thing on Facebook and I don't know, I'm kind of now I'm beginning to wonder what, I, what I'm standing on. Children are easy to fool. Don't be a childish Christian. Be a growing Christian. 
challenge yourself and grow and measure yourself to the Word of God. And you say, well, wait a minute. What they're saying goes against what I've believed about the Word of God. Let me look at that as a skeptic and prove it through here. And if I can prove it wrong through here, I'm going to believe this and not them. Amen. He says in verse 15, but speaking the truth in love. Now let me stop right there for one sec. And I may just end here. I don't know. This is where we need to grow in grace. This is where we need to grow in grace. If there's one thing that you would set a goal for the rest of the year, it would be this. Can you get better at speaking the truth in love for God's glory? I asked you at the beginning of the year as we introduced the concept of grow. I asked you to set goals in particular areas of your life. If you don't remember those sermons, the first two sermons of the year, please go back and watch them. God said grow, I think, was one of them. And growing in all seasons of life was the other. I really wanted to challenge us to consider Him and to make a big vision for what God can do with a little bit of faith and a little bit of church and a few people. And I want you to stay on track with that. I want you to see that and do it and realize it in your life. And for this second half of the year that's coming up, I mean, we're past the midway point. There's only a few months left this year. Do you want it to be said of you in 2023 that you grew in your speech toward others? Look what he says in verse 15. He says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. How do we get to the measure of the fullness of the statue of Christ? Well, it starts with your words. Oh man, how do I fix my mouth? Well, it starts with your heart. You grow inside. How? Well, I got to get this in here. I got to get it in here so some wisdom will come out instead of foolishness. I got to change what, what's the old saying? G I G O? Garbage in, garbage out. Maybe we should change it B I B O. Bible in, Bible out. That's the way it ought to be. Some wisdom coming in and then some wisdom going out. And others will say, wow, that, your speech was really seasoned with grace. I mean, I doubt somebody's going to say that to you at work. You know, it'll be like, that guy just has such wisdom about him. Or he's level-headed in difficult times. Or what he says is true and he doesn't say it harshly. It ought to be known as Christians that we speak the truth in love. That ought to be our claim to fame. Well, I don't know about all Christians, but I know this one guy. And I tell you what, what he said was true. And he wasn't mean about it. He was kind and loving and truthful. That really ought to be our reputation. But we got to get the truth in our heart. We should show the gift of God's grace to others. He wants to give you more grace. Not so you can hold on to it, but so that you can share it and give it away through your words and your spirit. He talks about the tongue here. Let me read this to you. James 3, 5, Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. It only takes a little spark to set the whole building on fire. If we, if we give Valor here some matches, and he starts lighting them and throwing them, only one of them has to hit the carpet, and look out, we're in trouble. He's trying, your tongue is the littlest part of your body, and yet it's stronger than your fist. It's stronger than your foot. It has more power for destruction or to build someone up, right? Verse 6, he says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. Woe unto us when we have a pure river of water of life in our heart, and we're speaking bitter waters out of our mouth. When we're Spitting fire, if you will. We shouldn't be spitting fire at other people. Let God take care of that. Let His Word do the work. You speak the truth in love. Don't let your little tongue start a big fire. He calls it a world of iniquity. I mean, he compares it to like a world, a solar system. He's like, this little tongue, let me tell you how big of a problem it can create for you. Go to verse 29 in this chapter. He says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Whoo! I don't have to define that for you. You know what corrupt communication coming out of your mouth looks like. You know what words you shouldn't be using. <laughs> Brother Doug tells the story. 
uh, he, when he was growing up in church, they were had like a Sunday school thing, and he's part of it. And a kid said, a bus kid starts saying these things they shouldn't say, and the pastor's wife or daughter says, so, "Oh, we don't say those words in church." And brother Doug says, "We don't say those words at all." You know, like, well, "Amen." Good point, brother Doug. Right? Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Don't be a hypocrite. Well, I'm a, I'm a Sunday saint, and after that, I'm a filthy mouth. It shouldn't be that way. When a Christian lets corrupt communication pour out of their mouth, they're lighting fire. They're setting fire. They're going to set your household on fire if you're not careful. Look again, verse 29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good, that which is good to the use of edifying. It can be used to build people up. Your words should be building Christians up as they get closer to God. He says that it may minister grace unto the hearers. How can you measure yourself? What are the metrics of growth? Well, he said grace, and he said knowledge. And here's how you measure your grace. Are your words building people up to get closer to Christ, or are they tearing them down? If we'll work on this one thing as a church, God will give us great victory. As a, as a preacher that's grown up on a church pew in many different churches in different states, under different good men of God and some failures. I've always heard men talk about having roast preacher for lunch. Where they go home and they start saying, well, eh, old preacher, he, I heard him preach that one before. He did it better last time. Or I remember the other guy, he preached it a lot better than this guy. Or Look, I, I'm a sinner just like you. And I'm striving to get better just like you. And I don't want to go home and tear you down either. Isn't that a two-way street? I've heard preachers use their mouth to tear people down in the church, and I don't want to be guilty of that. I've heard preachers say some crazy things about people in their church. Listen, if there's a predator in the church and we need to warn you, we're going to warn you, uh, hey, buddy, you need to get out of here, and hey, don't let your kids near them or something like that. But what we don't need to do is go around sowing seeds of discord and lighting fires in the ears of people and saying, well, did you hear what they did? Or, oh, yeah, I tell you that guy. <laughs> I don't know, man. When we get in that spirit, we're devouring one another with our mouth. Satan has a root in your heart. He has a place at your table. And I want to make sure that we all work on this, that we get better on this. Every one of us. I imagine it could be said that every one of us this week has probably said something maybe we shouldn't have said. Unless somebody here has already achieved greatness and perfection. I imagine we've all said something with our tongue this year. We could have said a better way to give God the glory. Our words should be building people up. He says in verse 29 uh, that they good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Minister means serve. Serving grace. I've got, I've got a platter of grace for you here. I've got something that's going to build you up. It's going to give you some spiritual nutrition. It's going to help you out. Verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. He's in there permanently. Don't upset Him by using your tongue with the devil. Verse 31, Let all bitterness, like resentment, and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. You know what evil speaking is? Now somebody tell me, King James Bible, does evil always mean wicked? What does evil mean? To hurt. hurt. To harm. Harmful language. That should not be your reputation. There are some guys in this world and that's their reputation. You tangle with them, they're going to hurt you with their words. Don't be one of them. Don't let hurtful speaking, hurtful language, language that destroys people instead of building them up. You know, when somebody makes a mistake, they need to have correction and instruction. That's part of life. And you can always say, hey, you did a real good job there trying to do the right thing and I appreciate your effort and I see where you're going and you did good. But let me help you out over here. You kind of missed the mark over here. And it's important because God says this and I just want you to know. So keep it up. Keep moving in the right direction. Keep going a good job and you know God will continue to bless you instead of just smashing them and tearing them down and you always do wrong. We shouldn't have that type of language. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Again, destructive. Here we go, verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, 
tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Be quick to forgive somebody, but this word tender heart. Who is it in the Bible that has a heart like God? David. David. I want to give you an illustration. As we're going through Samuel on Wednesdays, we just went past some passages where Saul despised his son because of his son's victory and wanted to hurt his son. Wanted to put him to death. King David, on the other hand, oh, his son Absalom really did sin against him and the kingdom. And David's heart was a heart of forgiveness and restoration. David had a tender heart that when Saul was trying to kill him, he still came back and tried to help him. When David was on the run while Saul is trying to kill him, he was praying and blessing him. I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. I have to be right before God and not worry about getting even with my enemy, my foe, my brother. Tender-hearted. Does that describe you? Are you sensitive to God's things in your heart? Are you tender when it comes to obeying God? If we'll get this, then we'll grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, both now and forever, do you have a reputation of love and a tender heart? Let's work on our tongue. Let's work on our heart. Let's be the kindest person. What's he say? A friend must show himself friendly. We were talking to the young men on, uh, was it Wednesday night? about this other church we're going to go to. And you know what you have to do to make friends? you got to be friendly. Hey, I'm Adam. What's your name? Nice to meet you. You shake their hand. You look in the eyes. You give them a big old smile. God bless you. Tell me something good. How's God been to you? Find out who they are. Remember their name. Look them in the eyes. Love them. Love them. Boy, if we'll do that, then God can use us to reach more people. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would help us to measure up to your growth. Help us to grow to the measure of the fullness of the statue of Christ. Lord, I pray that you would give us spiritual fruit, give us more gifts of grace that we can share with others. And Lord, we put it all in your hands. We love you. We're so thankful for everything you've given us. Lord, we have some major health needs in our church and extended friends, and I just ask that you would answer. Lord, we need a miracle. I ask for one for Brother Anthony. He's laying in the hospital now. Lord, would you heal that man? Would you restore him to his family? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.